allowed for a, uh, for a period for our question and answers, and I'd be most happy to receive the ushers here. Who, sir, pass the mic over. Uh, may I request you to kindly identify yourself, please? Professor Ron Barnett, um, University College London, Emeritus Professor. Such a rich address to us all uh, this morning. Uh, just quickly, if I might, uh, Professor to just pick up three of your words of wisdom. You mentioned learning to understand others. You mentioned ecosystems of discovery. And you went on to refer to culture. And um, if I can just draw those together, you also mentioned the initiative in Cambridge of the establishment of the Global Humanities Initiative, uh, which I know too little, and I will go away and do my homework. Uh, but I just wanted to just reflect that, uh, ju just to urge that we don't think of matters of culture as simply matters for the humanities, mm -hmm. and to, as it were, sideline them off in say that's simply a matter for the humanities. This is a profound matter. I'm very interested to see in the little booklet here, there's a whole section on culture. This is a, a profound matter, in my judgment, that universities around the world need to address as universities and work out the implications of these ideas and sentiments uh, that you've offered as a professor to right across the university mm. in every discipline. I completely agree. I mean, we're all very much aware that there are scientific cultures that have been affected by uh, the origins of those cultures and how they then connect into other scientific cultures with other uh, roots, I think, is very important. Uh, if we think about engineering solutions, for example, there are deep cultural implications for the types of technology that are appropriate in, in different circumstances. So I can only agree and say that universities really do have to consider cultural implications in all fields of study, not simply in the humanities. Couldn't agree more. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. If you can kindly um, focus on the question that you wish to, to, to ask. Uh, I'm also from University College London. Um, thank you very much for this very rich presentation. It reminded uh, one of Newman, Humboldt, and uh, Jahiz, and many others. At the same time, I'm also reminded of the fact that as we speak right now, there are 74 universities in the UK which are on strike. Mm. And they are striking because they are concerned about the working conditions, mm -hmm. striking because some of the ideas that you talked about are not right. I would like to hear your <coughs> advice and your views on how do we negotiate and how do we survive these ideas that you talked about in the larger macro context in which the universities find themselves. And I'm sure you are aware of them much more than I am. No, I'm sure you've thought a lot about it as well. <sighs> It's obviously a very deep and complicated uh, question uh, with many aspects, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. But uh, I would say that uh, I am very struck that we are in a period of time when I think in the wider society there have been uh, political evolutions that in fact don't strongly support the entire thesis that I put on the table today. And I, I don't just mean questions around populism or questions around so-called nativism, which I think do challenge universities. They certainly challenge the notion of the global sweep and the need for international connectivity. But I also think of some of the perspectives uh, that challenge the very notion of uh, the possibility of truth by the way, I would argue that universities have created part of that dialogue themselves, but that's another long story uh, in parts of our uh, academic community, and we're in some senses reaping the whirlwind. But I would also say that there's a broader sense, uh, r remember the famous quote from a, a current cabinet minister that uh, everyone's sick of experts, that type of thinking really challenges the universities fundamentally. And I think part of what then has happened is that we haven't actually 
uh, invested in universities in the way historically forebears were doing. If you actually look at the per capita spending on students in most Western countries, it has gone down significantly since the 1960s. That was the uh, era when universities were being built up in many ways in many parts of the world, which is why sometimes we have lots of very bad buildings, I would say, at universities, but that's another, uh, another issue as well. Uh, but uh, the serious point here is that the investment has actually atrophied over time, uh, despite the rhetoric, and therefore I think we find ourselves in a position where there have been significant financial pressures on universities, and some universities have sought to manage that through some of the uh, uh, working condition challenges that you refer to. The most potent is what is referred to horribly as an English use as casualization. The idea that people are hired on uh, but they're not given any stability in their jobs and, and they don't know whether they will be hired from year to year, et cetera, et cetera. That has to be addressed. And I think the good news about the strike to, uh, right now, and there isn't much, but the good news is that piece of business is actually being discussed. And I think that that could in and of itself make a very big difference if we start to say that that whole trend has to be reversed. But it will have economic consequences because if that is going to be reversed, we're going to have to find other mechanisms uh, to either support the budget or bring in new resources. And I can only say that at Cambridge, we're working hard to find out how to bring new resource to bear rather than looking for places to cut because we don't feel as a globally relevant university that cutting at this point further quotes austerity uh, is, is the right way forward. I'm sorry, there's so much more to say, but that's a little hint. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, I'm Nassim Pakshiraz. I'm the head of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. It was very inspiring, thought-provoking. Um, I very much get your point about internationalization, but I wanted to ask a question about nationalization mm -hmm. of the universities, because what we see often is that academics do seek out these um, relations between the different universities, but they are so much in response to the research bodies that actually dictate and therefore enforce those kind of uh, collaborations. And we know that the humanities is under a lot of pressure in the way that the research grants and, mm. the, and the funding bodies are distributing those monies to these different uh, uh, disciplines. Cambridge as a leading university, what is Cambridge doing in trying to bring about more collaboration between UK universities to actually strengthen and grow humanities? Mm. I'm very heartened to hear about global humanities. I also made a note, uh, like my colleague there, to go and check it out. But would that include, for example, collaboration with other universities to protect and develop that area, which mm. is so crucial to, to our societies today. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, a very complicated question with a, a long historical uh, resonance, unfortunately, because I don't think that this, there is a sense of, of real concern in the humanities, but it's not new. I mean, this has been developing probably since the 1960s, again, pro progressively, I would say. Um, <coughs> So first off, I should say, as I mentioned, that the Global Humanities Initiative is nascent. So you're not going to find a huge amount online, so I just do warn you about that. We're working very hard to try to develop it now. But your point is, is exactly right. I mean, one of the things that we're doing is collectively, and I, I will say that I talked to other vice chancellors from across uh, the United Kingdom, including your vice chancellor, your, your uh, principle uh, very uh, extensively about the desire to ensure that funding across the board remains rooted in peer review and excellence and is not rooted only in industrial strategy. Uh, because the further that we move away from the opportunity to investigate 
because something needs to be investigated, not because we know now what the result will be, uh, then I think we would position ourselves dreadfully as a great research nation or nations uh, within uh, the United Kingdom. So I think that's really important. Now, I will say that I'm not sure that is a winning battle right now. Uh, I'm really concerned. One of the risks that I think we face in ex exiting Europe is the uh, European Research Council funding, for example, was excellence driven and designed to foster collaboration. A quotes made in the UK solution, if it is purely national, will not address that problem and in fact will set us backwards. So if indeed we move in that direction and we don't remain uh, what's called an associate member of uh, Horizon Europe uh, going forward, then we are going to press very hard to ensure that any replacement system is also rooted in uh, the acknowledgement that basic research is crucial, curiosity-driven research, and that it has to foster collaboration. On the humanities specifically, uh, I think this is now a dialogue that we are having with government. And I'll give you a very concrete example, which is a good news story. Uh, you may have seen that the, and I'm, then I'll stop answering this question, I apologize, uh, but you've really hit a nerve. Uh, the the uh, government, the new government, uh, initially was talking with universities about changes to what was called the tier one visa system. Uh, and in so doing, they were actually talking about very positive changes from our perspective that would open up new possibilities for people to come to the United Kingdom uh, more easily. And they have indeed done that. But I'll be frank, and I'm giving a little bit of the background away here. When that began, it was stem, 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 stem. And the universities pushed back very hard and said, it cannot be just STEM, because the challenges that the world faces require the humanities, require the social sciences. I mean, just think about climate change. Behavioral change is the key to addressing climate change, and that requires narrative. And the humanities are where we're going to provide narrative. It's not going to come from, with greatest of respect, our engineers and our scientists, because that's not what they do and they don't have the, the real capacity to articulate in ways that are socially compelling. So uh, we have to keep working at this, and I think it is a, it's a serious battle because it relates pre to the previous question, which is the surrounding sort of distrust, in a way, of what it is that happens within mm -hmm. universities. And I know that we have to keep making the case more <coughs> profoundly that what happens in universities is about the wider world. It's not. I, I refuse to use the term ivory tower. I refuse it because it's not what universities are. Having protected space to think, I, I talked about, but that's not the same as being isolated from our societies. And I don't believe that we are isolated. Well, thank you very much. I know there are several uh, uh, guests here who would like to, to ask more questions. Unfortunately, we are a little bit time bound. But the good news is that. Vice Chancellor too will be having lunch with us in, in, the, in, the, in the foyer here, so there will be opportunities for for dialogue, and I must thank you, sir, for a very enlightening uh, lecture and the very enlightening responses. Thank you so much. Stay here, stay here, stay here. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor uh, Sohel Nakwi as the rector of the University of Central Asia. Uh, many of you have known him earlier, but most probably haven't. Uh, Dr. Nakwi um, is an engineer. <laughs> I will be speaking about it. <laughs> <laughs> but he is an engineer of, uh, of a different ilk, and which is why he is here currently uh, with us, 
trying to help us to lead this university to new grounds. And we have very clearly heard the message about the humanities, and I know he's, an, he's a champion for that. Um, I also wanted to mention that Dr. Nakwi uh, has been teaching in the United States at Arizona State. He then was uh, head of the uh, Ghulam Ishaq Khan uh, Institute of Technology in Pakistan. Later on, he and I worked together on the reforms of higher education. He was a member of my committee, uh, and the uh, result was the establishment of the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. And eventually, we decided that we needed somebody to implement those reforms, so we inducted Sohel into that role. An engineer. <laughs> we needed good systems. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we did that for eight years in public service. Eventually, he decided that he wanted to go back to academia, and he then was appointed the, uh, the rector of the Lahore University of Management Sciences, which is one of Pakistan's leading institutions. Uh, and uh, from there, we thought, well, it was time for him to move to the mountains. <laughs> so that's how. Sohel is now the rector of the University of Central Asia. And Sohel, please. Thank, Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Princess Zara, Professor Tu, Dr. Laka, Excellencies from especially recognize the ambassador of uh, Kyrgyzstan and the ambassador of Tajikistan. A real pleasure and colleagues. Uh, to be here. I'll be uh, giving you just a little glimpse um, into the University of uh, Central Asia. But rather than uh, speaking uh, about what kind of programs we have and the structure, etc., I'm going to take up uh, specifics and uh, uh, essentially talking about it from an application-oriented point of view, which is not a bad way to sometimes uh, uh, look uh, at things. I will just make um, uh, one remark about humanities and uh, social sciences and the developing world because for eight years heading the Higher Education Commission, this is a problem that we wrestled with. And I have to make a confession over here. We were not very successful with it because it is much harder than STEM, actually. <laughs> And also, it unleashes a genie that you just can't put back in the bottle again. And that is the reason that you see it drawn back and a great effort to leave the genie in, 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 in the bottle because you free the mind and then you see what happens. <laughs> but freeing the mind is what this uh, university is all about and why we have a core uh, curriculum, why there is a focus on the value system, the value system that drives the Aga Khan Development Network and the value system that humanities need, humanity needs uh, to prosper and to grow so that it is not about all accumulation of everybody's resources, but it is about mutual benefit and mutual growth. And it is also about the university's role in uh, development. And that is why uh, these institutions of ours, multiple campuses, are located in uh, the mountain communities because we are going to walk the talk uh, that we have. Now, just moving forward, it is very important to uh, uh, understand the University of Central Asia within uh, the context of uh, the Aga Khan uh, Development Network and uh, uh, it, all of its enterprises, all of the organizations are, are listed uh, over here. Uh, in totality, it is a closed uh, system. There is no funds going out of this, of this system. But there is a recognition of fund generation and then there is a recognition of the role that humans play. And then there is a very important role of culture. You will not see this prominence given to culture uh, anywhere. And yet there is a very 
potent business case to be made. Because as we all know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> Different kind of culture, but uh, uh, nevertheless. And uh, it is uh, this uh, platform, uh, these deep roots that provide the environment for uh, the university uh, to act as the conduit of these ideas, these thoughts, the research, its practice, and its implementation on the ground, and vice versa. So uh, the phenomenal data that exists, whether in the health sector, whether in the development of the, of the garden uh, in uh, Cairo, whether in historical preservation, to come back and to feed especially programs uh, such as uh, one being contemplated on global humanities. So here are the campuses. The reason that I decided to come to the University of Central Asia, I realized and I found out that it serves me with giving me the opportunity or one of the best opportunities to follow my dream and passion. So University of Central Asia is always supporting students who are willing to take part of some conferences or events. For instance, personally, I participate in uh, Model United Nations in Uzbekistan and in Tajikistan in Oro. And we also participate in media uh, professional development in Kazakhstan, in Almaty and debate tournaments in Dushanbe Amin. So we have a lot of opportunities here where you want to go somewhere. You see it's always supporting the students. Students were teaching local community uh, in different fields. Um, I personally was teaching 15 community um, uh, members basic computer skills, which, is, which was also really fun and interesting experience for me. This past summer I had an amazing opportunity to study at the international uh, summer program which, uh, which were held by the University of Cambridge, uh, England, UK. This campus seems to have everything that uh, you would think it needs. Uh, it's got a beautiful library, it's got great eating facilities, it's got dormitories, it's got classrooms, and everything is state-of-the-art. Everything here is the way you would get it. In fact, in some of the uh, better universities in America, they're so old that they don't have some of the electronics that are necessary and plugs for everybody to use their, uh, their computers. This place is designed to make it easy to study. One of the things that caught my attention is how many of these students are not looking for an escape hatch. They're not looking for a ripcord. They're not here to get out. This is not their ticket out of Central Asia. They want to improve Central Asia. Their whole idea is how do I make it better? How do I bring some of the things that I know exist elsewhere in the world, some of the comforts and some of the improvements that'll make people feel more prosperous and improve their standard of living? And I think that's fascinating. So many times when you come from an isolated area, a university is your ticket out. They're not looking for a ticket out, they're looking for a ticket up. Okay. So this ticket up is not an individual ticket. This is going or this is endeavoring to raise the sea level and it's a very big endeavor. So it is education and research to enhance the quality of life. This is where it plugs in into the mission of uh, the Aya Khan Development Network. Economic, social, cultural uh, development, a regional resource for contextually relevant research. And all of this but is going to be built, but it is going to be premised on building these ecosystems that Professor Tu uh, spoke to. So let me take an example uh, led by uh, the Graduate School of Development. We have three schools. The Graduate School of Development, what you saw was the School of Arts and Sciences, and then we have the School for Professional and Continuing Education. Life in Kyrgyzstan, a conference, a phenomenal uh, data set. This is the sixth uh, year that this study is being done, 3,000 households, bringing researchers from outside to study what is, what is going on. 
and then to make policy recommendations and work with government based on real situation of exactly what is going on uh, on the ground over here. An executive masters in economic policy, but not just any executive masters where you're going to the library and picking up the latest and best cases. First, you spend multiple years contextualizing. You build the casework, you build the, uh, the information that you're going to be transmitting. And then working with the Ministry of, of Finance, these are all Ministry of Finance uh, officials, these are at the graduation uh, ceremony with the finance uh, minister, and then having an executive format so these working professionals can come um, and uh, 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 their work is not uh, disrupted. The School of Professional and Continuing Education in Afghanistan. This is northern uh, Af Afghanistan. This is, these are some of the most isolated uh, regions um, in, in the world. And uh, uh, this is uh, not unusual for the School of Professional and Continuing Education, which has worked with more than 150,000 students worldwide. Um, and here, 14,000 SPCE learners since 2012, and 53% of them are, are women, working on entrepreneurship, working uh, in English, working uh, in accounting. We have local uh, uh, textbooks and providing international qualifications, including the Cambridge qualifications in uh, Afghanistan on uh, their uh, doorsteps. The uh, environment, climate change, and mountain uh, societies, we spoke about that. Well, this is our backyard over here. Literally, you will walk out of, of there, and this, this is what it is. But this backyard is changing very fast. Climate change is not a fury over there. It's right there in the river flow uh, increases that are, ha that are happening. So how are we looking at this environment? We have the Mountain Societies Research Institute co-located with the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences in Khorog, uh, in Tajikistan. We have students starting with their self-development, working uh, to address environmental issues within the institutions. And then we have students working with the community. This is a green Narin narrative. Narin is a phenomenally beautiful uh, community, and it's organic. So what, how do we take that and make an economically viable case uh, uh, for that? So this is how we want to combine uh, research, teaching, application, and bring it and make an impact on the societies uh, that we are uh, working with. The Narin Town Development Plan, uh, there is also a similar Khorog Town uh, Resiliency uh, Project that is going to include the Khorog ta Town Development uh, Program. But working with the government of uh, Kyrgyzstan, working with the oblast of, Kyrgyz, uh, of Narin, working with the city of Narin. This is a jointly funded project. So. Uh, uh, and then bringing in the horsepower of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture with their phenomenal record of town uh, planning. Looking 30 years ago, uh, hence, how is the university town going to be? What is going to be the impact of the university on uh, this phenomenally beautiful uh, town? Giving them the hope and the future and Focusing on this idea, there is no ticket out. We are going to call the world in, in, in as, and uh, that is the way forward. The education improvement program that is going on, uh, this is a project that the university has taken on, adopting 20 schools each in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Kazakhstan that are identified by the respective governments. There is never a work that is not in partnership uh, with government, working with the ministries, working to enhance the curriculum, working with the local realities. This is where we're also partnering uh, with Cambridge University Department, uh, uh, with the uh, education uh, folks, uh, perhaps taking some of the lessons from Kazakhstan and, and, and bringing them uh, over here. But teacher training, this is not just something uh, that we are going to be looking at it from a formal perspective. There's also many informal interactions. Our teachers working with the English teachers, our students working with the local schools over here. 
We have a community of students and they need to engage and be one with the community that, that they work with. Ah, <laughs> now, uh, so that, w that was it. I had very uh, uh, little time uh, to speak about the university and I just wanted to give you a snippet and of course would also want to invite all of you uh, uh, to the University of uh, Central Asia and come and, and, and take a look and have, and also invite partnerships. That is uh, one way that we can work here. But now, uh, in this journey, the most critical ingredient is the teacher and the faculty member. And that is why this partnership with the Cambridge uh, Trust is so uh, uh, important um, and something that I do know a lot about because this is the second organization that I'm working with that I am signing uh, and I'm going to be signing this uh, agreement uh, with, with the Cambridge uh, Trust. But there is one important change that is occurring. This is a renewal of the, of the agreement that we had signed. And that is that there is the possibility of opening this, this to the wider AKDN community and providing them a pathway for uh, PhD studies. So perhaps Nimit is going to sign up for PhD, I don't know. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this will be uh, an opportunity for all of us uh, to be developing uh, together. Helen is, of course, director of the Cambridge uh, Trust, a, a fellow of uh, Clare Hall, not Clare College, which we passed by, um, uh, in, in, in Cambridge, and a trustee of uh, SOAS. Great pleasure, Helen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, Princess Zara, Dr. Kasim Lakha, Professor Nakvi, Vice Chancellor, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, and of course, students. Um, so I am Helen Pennant, and I would like to start by saying how delighted I am that we have the opportunity to celebrate a decade of excellence in partnership with the University of Central Asia. I would like to extend my gratitude also to Princess Zara for allowing us to have such a wonderful tour of this building, its amazing gardens and courtyards. As many of you know, and as uh, Professor Nuckley has just shown us on the map, the campuses of, of the University of Central Asia are located along the Silk Road, a historic transportation route which for centuries has facilitated the global exchange of goods, culture and ideas. It is in the spirit of this openness to new ideas and a shared commitment to the development of mountain societies that the Cambridge Trust formally renews its collaboration with the University of Central Asia today. Now, the Cambridge Trust was established over 30 years ago to provide financial support to international students so that they could benefit from the educational and research opportunities at the University of Cambridge. A charitable foundation, the Trust works with around 90 partners worldwide. Together, we provide the widest possible pool of talent that our students represent proud to support around 500 students at Cambridge every year, which gives us 1,200 in residence at any one time. Now, in 2009, we were delighted to be able to partner with the very newly established University of Central Asia, supporting its future faculty to gain postgraduate degrees. The scholarships provided, thanks to this partnership, cover the full costs of study and living in Cambridge for the duration of each student's degree course. The scholarships support students at both masters and PhD levels in subjects related to the focus areas of the University of Central Asia, which are computer science, media and communications, economics, engineering, business administration, and public policy. Eligible students within these subject areas must be offered admission to the University of Cambridge on their merit, and they must come from Central Asia's mountain societies. 
located in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, and northern Pakistan. Since the initial agreement was made, six students have graduated, three from Kyrgyzstan and three from Kazakhstan. Three received master's degrees and three PhD degrees. The agreement we're about to sign today will support a further nine students, and importantly, both from the University of Central Asia and the wider Aga Khan Development Network, so that they can gain postgraduate degrees at the University of Cambridge. As potential future faculty of the University of, Sa of, of Central Asia and professionals working in the wider Aga Khan Development Network, these students, alumni and future students will be at the heart of an intellectual and economic transformation in the region. These students, they are the most important catalysts for change. And this is why the Trust's partnership with the University of Central Asia is so special to us. Together, we share the aim of building capacity through education, and more precisely, to create knowledgeable, skilled, and creative graduates who can contribute leadership, ideas, innovations to the transitioning economies and communities of the region of Central Asia. Now, I'm very pleased that our seventh recipient of the scholarship, Mr. Adil Shah from Pakistan, is here today because I think that he embodies some of the aspirations that we have for this scholarship. Adil bega began his PhD degree in engineering in October with the long-term goal as work of working as an academic researcher. In his own words, paving new ways unlocking new possibilities, solving one riddle after the other and giving hope to a sustainable future for humanity. So I think you will agree that education is by far the most important contributing factor to development. Empowering individuals like Adil through education has a sustainable long-term impact on communities. Uh, Dr. Kasim Lakha has talked about the challenge of delivering primary and secondary education, but I would like to say that postgraduate education could perhaps be seen as having the greatest impact since by forming the teachers and researchers of the future, there is a multiplying effect as they are in turn empowered to educate those that follow. Now, Professor Toop talked about the importance of equitable partnerships, so I would like to stress that the benefit of this partnership is certainly not one way. Cambridge benefits enormously from the presence of postgraduate students from Central Asia, and this is because we cannot hope to address the global challenges we face today without that diversity of perspective. I would like to ask you here, the audience, to do something to um, support our work. Please spread the word. There are many talented young people from Central Asia who could benefit from one of these scholarships, and I'd like to enlist your help to encourage those who might be eligible to apply. Knowing that Cambridge is a competitive process, many young people do not feel they would, will succeed. But nothing is gained from not trying. And the scholarships make it possible for people to come to Cambridge, whatever their background or financial means. Scholarships make inclusive education possible. The importance of education was recognised in the UN's goals for sustainable development. It sets quality education as a goal. But the vision of this quality education is inclusive and equitable as well as high quality. And so not surprisingly then, there is also a specific call in the UN's agenda for more scholarships as a means to attain that goal. The partnership that we are celebrating today is making a contribution towards that shared blueprint for peace and prosperity. I'm very grateful that right from the beginning, this partnership 
has received support from the very top. Indeed, the original signing ceremony in 2009 coincided with His Royal Highness the Aga Khan's visit to Cambridge to receive his honorary doctorate. Unfortunately, I was not yet at the Cambridge Trust at that time, but I understand that the Trust actually had the honour of hosting His Highness. His Highness has spoken of education as a force for cooperation and healing in our world, and his initial support has served as an inspiration for our ongoing partnership. This high-level support has also helped the Cambridge Trust build a connection to the wider Aga Khan Development Network, and I must express my thanks to them and the Aga Khan University for supporting the Cambridge Trust's outreach activities in East Africa. Finally, I would like to thank Professor Nakvi and his team for being such excellent colleagues. I look forward to continuing this important work with you and to welcoming many more scholars to Cambridge. Thank you very much. Can I say thank you to Helen, who has been very unwell but has made the journey down to London today. Thank you, Helen, for being with us today. I think we've just witnessed what is the celebration, I think. But we had one yesterday as well, which we would like to also share with you. It's a short video, um, and we would like you to be part of it, and we'll be very happy to show it to you now. shortly be signing a memorandum of understanding between the University of Central Asia and the University of Cambridge. And this will formalize our intention to continue to explore ways of working more closely together, whether in joint research or in staff and student exchange or the development of educational opportunities. Partnership between institutions and amongst us is crucial. And that is why Cambridge strives to work in partnership with leading organizations around the world. I wanted to uh, say that as a very young university, University of Central Asia is fortunate to have benefited from partnerships with uh, academic institutions from North America, uh, from uh, Australia, from Russia, and from Central Asia. Uh, but today is a very special day <coughs> for UCA. Uh, it's a special day when we are formalizing a um, a very important partnership for the first time with the UK institutions as, as a university partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and my colleagues and I see this probably as one of our most important partnerships. When the foundation ceremony of the Koro, uh, the Koro campus was being laid uh, in, as far back as 2004, um, His Highness uh, mentioned, and I'm quoting, there are two measures of success of any university, the careers of its graduates and the quality of research, which is carried out in the universities and then is used for the benefit of communities that the university serves. So since then, he has at every occasion and at every board meeting has continuously exhorted us um, as a young university to set 
our sights at becoming a research university. Um, while this is a daunting challenge, and we have a lot to learn, who could be a better partner in this endeavor than Cambridge? I was with the Chancellor yesterday of UCA, and he asked me where I was going, and I said that Cambridge had kindly invited me, along with Shams and our UCA colleagues, uh, here for this ceremony to, today. He was, he was really thrilled. So the Chancellor is really, really thrilled, and um, I, I know that he views such moments as this as being really seminal in the progress of young universities like UCA. So on behalf of His Highness, our Chancellor, and uh, the Board of Trustees, I would also like to thank you, Vice Chancellor Toop, uh, for inviting us here and for this MOU, for everything that Cambridge is already doing with our institutions. And I hope that, as, as Shams said, I, I, we all hope that this will lead to, lead to a very varied um, and long-term collaboration. And I think that this uh, partnership now uh, is a natural continuation of a long uh, journey and uh, would uh, hopefully provide uh, your uh, colleagues at this esteemed institution uh, an opportunity to work in our beautiful part uh, uh, of the world. Thank you.